Welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to take a look at how to do scenarios for muskets and tomahawks. So this is the second edition of muskets and tomahawks. This is actually the um, not the best uh, quality wise. But anyway, this is the, the first expansion. Redcoats and Tomahawks. Uh, the Muskets and Tomahawks book is just the core rules. And Redcoats and Tomahawks goes into uh, the French Indian War, the War of 1812, the American War of Independence. Got to put them out of order. Um, uh, it, it's, the, it's the rules that used to be in the first edition uh, are now in the first expansion. And there's a second expansion called uh, Bayonets and uh, Shakos, I think it's called. Uh, muskets and bayonets and my, anyway i haven't got it i haven't got the second edition for napoleonics because my napoleonic playing is mostly done in sharp practice but i should get it anyway so the, the the things i'm saying in here are applicable to that as well so how do you set up a scenario for muskets and tomahawks i'm not going to talk about how to play muskets and tomahawks uh the game itself is really ancillary to all this this could all be done for uh, 40k warhammer fantasy for Star Wars Legion, for any any game you want, could use this this system of, of determining who's the attacker and defender, for example. Um, where are we playing uh, side plots? Which I've I've been a fan of side plots for more than a decade now. Um, don't always use them, but they're they're really interesting. I've been thinking about them for a long time. Anyway, so Muskins and Tomahawks. The first thing you need to do is decide whether you're going to play in an in an inhabited area or in a savage wild area. So, uh, uh, so is there going to be buildings and people or is there not going to be buildings and people? That's the first decision. Um, so let's do up a little mini campaign for the French and Indian War. But first of all, let's go through um, how to build a scenario and then we'll link them together. So um, you've decided, so let's say we're going to decide to play the first game. We're going to make it very easy. We're in the wilderness. There's trees and rocks and bushes and things like that, but there's no people. Um, not even not even Americans. There's no one. So what we're going to do is we're going to play during the French and Indian War. Um, we're going to build a force. My favorite force, of course, is my provincials, my uh, my New York provincials. Um, in there, interesting. There's the uniforms they're wearing. Wearing. I'll see if I can find pictures of them. I don't have them with me, but I painted these up a long time ago. I love these galloping major figures. Are my favorite for the provincials. Warlord would work fine as well. Anyway, rambling and tangents aside. Uh, I've got a force of provincials, my good noble sons of of what will become America in 20 years. Um, provincials were militia troops from the um, from the the colonies. They were the col colonial uh, American forces. So they're not militia, though they're separate. Anyway, it's a different story. Anyway, I've got provincials, which are semi-trained militia, up against a force of regulars. So my friend's got some French regulars. Uh, which are in the wilderness somewhere doing something nefarious in French. So the first thing we do is we both roll a d10. So all, all the rolls in this will be d10s uh, because Muskets and Tomahawks has gone to a d10 system, which, again, there's a lot of merits in a d10 system that I quite like. It would be nice if more games did it, I think. It would be kind of cool. It would help fix a lot of the problems with 40k and that sort of thing. Anyway, both players roll a d10, and if you get a zero which is a 10, but 10 is zero in this system. Uh, if either of you get a, a zero, uh, then there's some sort of weather. Now, weather is fascinating. It's something you never, ever see in games. You never see weather in games. Uh, is it snowing? Is it raining? Is there wind? Is there a sandstorm? You never see it. it it's one of those things that's just never made, made it into gaming. Um, I remember the Battle Games in Middle-Earth came out years ago. Like 20, uh, probably 20 years ago now. It, oh yeah, maybe even longer than that. Battle Games in Middle Earth had a whole, uh, a, a, I'll put the picture of it up here. It had a whole thing on rain and wind and fog and, and it had a whole thing on weather and how weather could affect games of, of Lord of the Rings. Uh, and Muskins and Tomahawks has a whole spotting system. So if it's snowy or foggy, it's going to affect the way your game plays. Uh, it's not like, oh, you're limited to 12 inches vision or whatever. It's your, your light infantry can see further than your heavy infantry heavy your your line infantry uh, once people start shooting they're going to start giving themselves away so your your maybe your lines can get closer before they can start firing uh, it, it's going to change the way you play a game if you have any weather so uh, once you figure out any weather 
you move on to who's going to attack and who's going to defend. So the way you choose attacker and defender is you both roll a number of dice. So uh, the militia, sorry, the provincial player in this situation is me. And provincials are mostly defensive forces. And they did accompany regular columns and things like that. They did attack. Uh, but provincials are mostly a defense force. Um, George Washington led a bunch of provincials out in the, in the wilderness um, towards the middle and end of the war, which did very little, but they sort of skirmished a bit. Um, so if you've got a town, provincials are more likely to be defending it than attacking it, as you can understand. So the way that, that works is provincials roll two dice and they pick the lowest. Um, and the highest score is the attacker. So a force of Indians, a force of natives, rolls four dice and picks the highest. So you can tell Indians, native troops, are almost always going to be attacking, um, which makes sense of raiding, attacking, uh, ambushing people, that sort of stuff. So um, the, your force, which is mostly made up of, of natives, is going to be an aggressive attacking force. Your force of militia is almost always defending because they roll three dice and pick the lowest. So in our situation, uh, we've got a force of regulars who just roll one dice and that's their dice. Uh, up against the force of provincials who roll two dice and pick the lowest. So it's not super crazy. You can roll an eight and a nine and the other person can roll a one, in which case you'd be attacking, but it's more likely than not that our provincial troops are going to be defending anyway. Um, if we're built playing in an inhabited area, we have some civilians, which always get put on the table. Um, let's, let's just stay with the wilderness for now. Uh, and then we roll missions. So the, one of the things I love about, about Muskets and Tomahawks, and it's why I wanted to sort of showcase this sort of way you do scenarios, is that you don't play the same mission, um, which is a, th a concept which is so basic, but it's really not something we do in other games. Like if we've got an objective game, we're both going for it. We're both going for the same objectives. But Muskets and Tomahawks, you can, I'm trying to burn your village down. And you're just trying to scout the area. You know, you don't really care that much. So, so we're both playing different games. So I'm trying to stop you from getting your objective because I want to ruin your French day. Uh, but you're also trying to stop me getting my objective. But if we, if, if you scout the area and I burn the village down, well, you can go back and tell them that you scouted the area and there used to be a village there, but, well, the provincials just set it on fire. So there's not a village anymore. So scouting job done. Uh, and I can go out there and say, well, there were some French nosing around and they sort of had a look at the place, but I burnt the village down. So, you know, I did what I was meant to do. Um, it's a it's a, uh, it's a really cool and interesting way because uh, enemies are not sent out there to say, you just make sure the other person doesn't get his job done. You know, that's a part of why you're finding them. But it's not, it's, you know, it's, you don't go out to, to stop the enemy doing something. I mean, maybe you do, but I mean, that's sort of a, that's a pretty defensive uh, battlefield style and, uh, I'm sure most military tacticians would say if you're if you're reacting to the enemy, you're in a bad situation. So the idea that you're both got objectives, that you're both trying to accomplish separate to one another, while at the same time trying to stop the enemies, is really cool. So there are three scenarios for each person for each um, place. So there are twelve scenarios. So you've got uh, attacking an inhabited area. The attacker can either raid, massacre, or capture. Lovely bunch of scenarios there. And the attacker in the wilderness, which is what we're going to be doing, can either explore, battle, or reconnaissance. So uh, we'll say we'll we'll say the regulars rolled high. We won't do it rolling on this. I'll just we'll just theorize. Imagine the dice rolling in your own head as they bounce around your empty skull or whatever. You know that's what I either do in my head all day. So our provincials have rolled very low, so they're defending, and the uh, the dastardly evil Frenchmen have come to do a bit of reconnaissance uh, in this this wilderness area to make way for for some other group of evil Frenchmen to come through. The, the regulars have come in in force to push through uh, to find the best way forward for a, uh, a raiding party of, of natives and, and Courier de Bois and, uh, and Milice Canadiens and all those, those are evil French types. So the regulars have pushed in in force spread out to find uh, the weak spot where the uh, where the raiders can slip through. Uh, and the defenders, we've we've dis we've been told that we must defend this area. Uh, we've been given a sector, or whatever the, the 18th century equivalent of a sector is. Um, we've been told from that rock to that piece of woods over there, you're not letting anyone through. And uh, so what we're going to do is um, we are going to 
defend our area. We're not going to let you get through. We're going to we're going to stop you here. Um, but you're just trying to reconnaissance. The the French are not trying to to wipe out the the provincials. They're not trying to force them out of anywhere. They don't really want to try and break through. They're probing the line. So the French are just trying to reconnoitre the area, and the provincials are trying to defend it. And this would be very easy to roll up. You would just have two D3s that happen to coincide. So in this case, we've got a scenario where the provincials are trying to keep the French away from certain areas, and the French just need to reconnoitre the general vicinity. So they've got to move troops into different quarters or, or sectors of the board, uh, depending on what size of game you're playing. You've got to move them around certain places. Um, so the British don't really care if you're moving troops over there because they're not defending that area. They're defending this area. Um, so you can already see how the game has got a little bit more uh, story to it. But what's really going to add the depth to the game are the intrigues and the side plots. Our provincials have been told to defend this area. The French have been told to reconnoiter it. Uh, let's have a look at the intrigues and the side plots. So these are my favorite parts of, of uh, Muskets and Tomahawks. And the game, you can see how this scenario generator is not nearly as detailed as the one for Force of Virtue, which you can go and have a look at. Uh, it's one of the videos I put up on the channel. So this scenario generator is more about uh, why are we fighting this particular battle um, rather than linking scenarios together. Uh, you could do that, but that's going to take a lot more creativity on your part. The game's not going to feed it to you anywhere near as much as Force of Virtue does. But one of the great things that this game has given to the wargaming industry, uh, besides Perry artwork, it's just gorgeous. Um, it's Peninsula Perry artwork, which is nice. Uh, that's uh, that's the uh, the famous kit of the the dentist yanking someone's tooth out, which I'm going to have to get my hands on someday because I think it's great. So one of the things that the Game Gear has given us is uh, intrigues and what used to be called side plots, but I think they're just called intrigues now, but I'm going to call them side plots because I'm old school. So you choose a, a um, you choose to, to do them or not do them, always choose to do them, why wouldn't you? Uh, and these can be so transplantable to other game systems. Uh, you can you can dump this in your games of 30k or 40k. Uh, so we'll do one for we'll we'll roll it up. We'll get the magic dice roller back out. We'll roll one up for our provincials and our French. So we will need to get our wonderful display capture thing back up. There we go. I managed to not destroy that, which is good. So the first thing that happens is always ignore the first roll. The first thing that's going to happen is we're going to roll a gift. So by taking an intrigue, you get what's called a gift, which is a once per game ability to offset any negatives that can come from the intrigues. So our provincial commander is energetic. Once per game, after one of your side's troop cards has been resolved, reserve that troop card to the top of the shared deck. So you're getting more activations once per turn, uh, once per game, sorry. And our French commander is an authoritarian, evil French dictator. Um, once per game, if your commander gives an action with the forward boys, the on avant, um, to a unit with the forward boys card, they gain scouts, even if they are mounted, and increase their movement by two. So you can essentially turn, uh, once per game, your regulars into scouts and zip them up board, uh, which is kind of cool. So we've got a an energetic provincial officer and an authoritarian, strict, do-as-I-say French officer. You can already see how the story is evolving here. So the way it works for the entry table is we roll two d10s. One of them is the is the which chart we're rolling on, and the other one is which um, intrigue we're picking. And the game says you roll two, and then decide which is the chart and which is the intrigue. So we'll roll that for the we'll start with the French this time. So our authoritarian Frenchman has got a nine and an eight. Um, lovely. There's lots of lots of variability there. So. Um, Eight and nine are the same chart. So you can see from, from this book. Um, so what we'll do is, it doesn't matter if eight or nine is the tens or the ones. So number eight, um, uh, I think the boss is drunk. <laughs> so the French officer could be drunk. That could be one of the intrigues. Every time you spend a command point, roll a d10. Um, if it's even, the points are spent, but you don't get to use the ability. And if it's odd, you use the ability. And if you get to use three abilities in the game, you've passed the entry, um, which means that in a tie, you'll, you'll win the game. Uh, but it also means you've accomplished your story. Uh, you had a little bit of a drink. 
to get your courage up because you're an authoritarian and it's sort of you, it's getting to you. The pressure is getting to you. You know, you got to you got to be strict and, and the men aren't listening and it's, it's stressed you out and you're, you're doing scout duty, which you shouldn't be doing because you're a French regular officer. What do they know about anything? You know, even though you're in the second battalion of some French unit that no one cares about, it's 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 honourable to be what you are, and you're skulking. So you've hit the bottle pretty hard, as the French often do, and you're now you're now drunk, raving as an authoritarian, screaming, trying to direct your troops around. Um, so that's if we take the eight as the ones column and the nine as the tens. But if we take the eight as the tens, we're still on the same chart, but we'll go to number nine, incompetent. <laughs> <laughs> so the French officer <coughs> is either drunk or incompetent. And I'm not sure what's worse. Uh, your commander doesn't count as an officer for the purpose of the forward boys card. Uh, if the end of the game you've won uh, before intrigues are taken into account, you've completed your intrigue. So essentially the second one is you don't get to use forward boys. Uh, but if you win the game, then you automatically complete your intrigue. So if you win the game, you win, essentially. Um What's interesting about that one is our gift affected our forward boys. So this uh, intrigue nullifies the gift that we were given. So we've got to make a decision between uh, the commander being a drunk or the commander being incompetent. And this is already adding way more depth to the scenario we're about to play uh, than our simple, we're trying to scout this area. Um, the, the, maybe the commander's been told to go scout this area with his regular troops because he is incompetent. Um, maybe he's become drunk because he was sent to do something he thinks is beneath him. Um, I think the only option here really would be to make him drunk. <laughs> Commanders, I think the boss is drunk. I think that's the only option here because that en avant is, uh, is the gift that he's got. We don't want to waste that. Uh, and that's pretty useful. That's a, that's an extra action um, the, for the officer, and you, you want him to be counting as an officer for those purposes. So, the French are trying to reconnoiter the area with a drunken lieutenant, um, or drunken captain, probably. Uh, so, the, so the drunken officer is, is raving about all this sort of stuff and about how his kids don't listen to him, and and you know it's it's, it's hard it's hard being in charge, and and no one cares, and all this other sort of drunken nonsense they're all going about. Um, what's the provincial doing? So, the provincial officer will get a gift of his own. Oh, sorry, he's got a gift already. Um, so let me roll those dice. So his gift was he was very energetic. So on a nine and a three, we can choose the number nine chart, which we'll have a look at. Number three, eccentric. Uh, he's an energetic eccentric. During the game, if you have three or more cards in your hand, you must play your card randomly instead of choosing it. If your commander survives the game, you've completed your objective. Um, so essentially... If you try and build up a hand of cards to decide when you're going to play them, um, you you must turn them over and randomly shuffle them and play one of them um, to represent your commander being eccentric and, and weird, which makes a lot of sense for someone who's energetic. Uh, but you can see that's a bit of a negative one. Um, and it doesn't say you have to win the game. It just says your commander has to survive. So that's interesting. We could take number nine and number three, but what if we took number three, uh, number nine, so 3-9 is uh, Lasting Rancor. When you deploy your commander, choose one of your units or one of your other officers. If the chosen unit or officer does not survive the game, you've completed your intrigue. So our energetic commander has, has got some people he does not like, uh, which again makes sense for a, for a provincial, uh, provincial officer is serving with men that he probably lives nearby. And you can imagine quite a few grudges, you know, the... the the, the Donovan twins were in that unit over there. It'd be quite nice if they didn't come home, you know, because the, they owe me money or one of them one of them beat my brother in a fight or something. Or that officer over there, that's Jim Spencer's brother. And our family's been hated and feuding with them for the past 30 years over some cow or whatever. So uh, the, the, that would be really nice if the French could, could capture him or blow his head off or something. So we've got a choice between an, an eccentric, energetic officer you sort of all bouncy all over the place, just excited to be there, um, and uh, who, who who doesn't really have a plan. Uh, he's been told to defend an area, and he, what, he, what he does is sort of, what the men do is what he does. Uh, or we have a sort of a, an energetic, bitter um, provincial officer who's more out for revenge than, than, than necessarily the good of the unit. I personally would take the eccentric one. Playing the random card sounds great. I'm not a fan of the card 
mechanic in the hand anyway. I prefer the old system where you were dealing them. So it's it, fine with me. Um, so in, in this scenario that we've just come up with off the top of our heads, the, uh, the French are trying to reconnoiter an area with a drunken officer, while the, uh, the provincials from New York are trying to defend the area uh, with an eccentric, young, energetic provincial officer who really doesn't have a plan or know what he's doing, but uh, he's going to put it all together and it'll come out right. Um, if only, if only, uh, man, it's sort of holding up a mirror to my play style. But um, anyway, that's how you could do a side plots for, uh, that's how you do side plots for muskets and tomahawks. And you see that they've, they've changed the way we're looking at the scenario. So with Force of Virtue, which again, you should, you should watch that video. The Force of Virtue was more about the scenarios linking together to form a campaign. This one, you're probably not going to play more than one or two games of muskets and tomahawks in a day. Whereas Force of Virtue, you can play multiple games in a, in a, in a day or, or a campaign setting. Muskets and Tomahawks, you're going to go, okay, how do we make this game that I'm playing right now more interesting? Um, which is what we're going to do in the 30k one, which will be its own video. I have decided off the top of my head it will be its own video. Um, so we've gone from, okay, we're going, to, uh, we're going to fight over some bushes. There's some scrubs and we're going to have a little bit of a shootout in the 18th century, 1759... America, we're gonna we're gonna shoot it out. Um, American colonies. To the French are sending some regulars to reconnoiter uh, the the softest place that the raiding force can get through to go and burn some town or village or whatever, uh, and then screen them as they come back. And this is something that the, the the French were constantly sending raiding parties out, which the provincials were countering. Uh, and the provincials have been told, look, you guys from this town, your barrier is from that tree to that piece of scrubland over there and no one gets past you defend it with your lives and so they don't really care what these regulars are sniffing around for they've been told not to let anyone pass and they're not letting anyone pass and their commander is an eccentric energetic little kid uh, who is who is running around trying to trying to figure everything out and he doesn't really know what's going on why have those why have the skirmishers moved up i didn't tell them to move up uh yo well, you better go after them <laughs> you know that sort of stuff uh well the authoritarian drunk French officer is berating everybody and, and, and going on lecturing to some sergeant who's telling him, we really actually should, should rally those troops. So they're, they're kind of in the middle of almost breaking, you know, they might run away. It's like, oh, well, my son ran away. You know, I never listened to me. I never cared. So that they're really, oh no, they're running. They're running right now. Yes. Yeah. It's just like my son ran away. So just rambling on about his drunken problems. So that is how to do up scenarios for muskets and homehawks. Again, we're not writing novels. Um, we're not being super historically accurate. We're, we're, we're playing with the vibe of the thing. There's, I won't put the, the clip in now, but there's a whole bunch of um, uh, charts. There's five charts, four charts, five charts with 10 options on each. So there's 50 options, 40, 50 options there uh, that you could just go through and pick uh, if you really wanted to tell some sort of story with your game. Uh, and if you wanted to play super historical, Matsu Tomahawk's probably not the best one for you to go through. You may want to find another game for that. So, that's how to do scenarios for muskets and tomahawks. We've done how to make the uh, campaigns more interesting with Force of Virtue. Now we've done how we can make our individual games more interesting with muskets and tomahawks. Thank you very much for watching. Have a wonderful day.